Okay, I've started the recording. Thanks, John. Okay, here we are. Um, so, ooh, oh, settle down there, presentation. All right, good morning, everybody. Um, it's a wonderful day. I have the gentle sound of, of inauguration coverage uh, a few rooms away. It's very soothing. It's like a morning meditation of hope. <laughs> um, but in the meantime, uh, we're going to talk about something that um, I think is always relevant, but has seemed uh, particularly needed uh, in, this, in, in our recent seasons, uh, nonviolent communication. Um, so this is something our office uh, put together this summer. Um, the actual presentation was created by our former staff member, uh, Fabio Machado, who's now back in Brazil. Um, so it's bright and engaging. So we're really happy to be able to share it. Um, so just so you know what's ahead, uh, we're gonna check in and do some introductions. Uh, we're gonna set up, offer some guidelines for dialogue as we uh, continue through the presentation. We're going to share a definition of nonviolent communication, uh, which we feel really starts with a conversation about empathy uh, and the importance of empathy. Uh, then we'll um, offer an overview of the of the steps of the process, um, and then we will try them together. We'll break out into groups and have an opportunity to uh, practice the art of nonviolent communication, which is helpful in with small conflicts like, no, I don't want to bungee jump <laughs> to uh, some of the larger, converse, more significant conversations we've been having around politics and, and personal values. Um, so and then we'll hope, hopefully have some time for questions and conversation about how this might work in a, in a classroom where this might be helpful um, and how it could play out with students or with, with colleagues or even family members. Um, so uh, I'm sure this is something everyone does at the beginning of conversations or, or some part of uh, with students just kind of setting the landscape for how we're going to have a conversation. Uh, so, so this presentation, as we're having this conversation, and, and really NBC is a great vehicle for this, we're going to focus on dialogue and not debate. It's a two-way process. Uh, it involves balancing um, uh, deep, I can't see my slide because of my gallery, <laughs> deep, I think, conversation with uh, open, honest sharing, but I can't see what that word is. Uh, we ask you to be an active listener, not to interrupt others. Only one speaker at a time should talk. Uh, avoid statements, um, ad hominem statements, <laughs> challenge the idea or claim. Rodman, talk about ad hominem because I think you that's yours. <laughs> So, so challenging an idea or a claim made by uh, is different than attacking a person, like saying you're a bad person for thinking X or Y, is different than challenging um, a person holding this or that view. Um, speak from your own experience. Um, everyone's encouraged to share, but, but really speaking using I statements uh, and not speaking for others unless they have asked you to giving you their consent to speak or share their experiences. Um, pass the mic is another one. So making sure that there's enough room for other people to sp speak and so forth. Um, practice self-care. So some of the topics we're gonna deal with today, some of the things just generally in the world can be triggering. And uh, if you need to step back away from the process and anything else like that, um, uh, the please do so. Uh, if you need help and you're struggling, you can reach out and direct message me or Annika or one of the other presenters or things like that. Um, be aware and sensitive to issues of power and privilege, right? You know, um, uh, as open as I try to be in terms of my functioning within, you know, our, our academic community, you know, I'm aware that um, I, uh, my office is attached to the president's office and that I am the chief diversity officer, um, and you know, I, I bring like what I call uh, in, in some facetious, facetious ways bits of coke with me wherever I go. Um, uh, 
I, I uh, in a job I had previous to this, you know, just sent an email out saying to some people, some faculty that I hadn't talked to, it's like, hey, I want to talk to you. And people came in really worried. And um, and reflecting on it, you know, you're getting a, an email from the Associate Vice President for Academic Affairs and the Chief Diversity Officer saying, I need to speak with you. And people panicked, like, what have I done? Did someone say something? I didn't think I did anything. Why does this person want to talk to me? And honestly, I just want to have a conversation and find out what you're up to and talk to you. But the power that comes with certain positionalities, not just in terms of officers or professions or things like that, but I, based in our social identities um, and the sort of unearned privileges uh, that come with that, we need to be aware of what that means as we enter into um, a dialogue space. So I'll stop talking. Um, one, for, one more thing though, Rodman. So I moved right into dialogue, dialogue, dialogue guidelines and didn't give us a chance to introduce ourselves. So um, Rodman, do you wanna start for those who um, don't know who you are yet? <laughs> Yep. Uh, I'm, I'm Dr. Robin King. I am the Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer uh, here at SUNY Oswego. I've been here. This is now my third academic year, which makes me, I don't know if I was a student, a rising junior or something like that, or second semester junior or something like that. Um, it's been a privilege to work uh, with this community, um, and I'm looking forward to our discussion today. My pronouns are, I uh, use he series pronouns, he, him, his. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thanks, Rodman. Um, so we have a, a crew from, from our office. Uh, we're really excited to, to say we have a team. Um, uh, our, our kind of logistical mastermind is, is Aaron Leary. Aaron, do you wanna take a minute and introduce yourself? Thank you, Annika. I'm the administrative assistant for the Office of Diversity and Inclusion. I've been in the office since this March. I am happy to be here and thank you for inviting me. On to Markel. <laughs> okay, good morning everyone. My name is Markel Jeffries. Um, I'm a May 2019 graduate of SUNY Oswego. Um, along with Aaron, I've been in a diversity office since May 2020 as well. Um, and I'm an assistant coordinator for diversity and inclusion. And my pronouns are he, him, and his. And I'll pass it off to the. Markel, you broke up a little, but I'm, I'm thinking you're talking, you're passing it off to Tiffany. Yeah, yeah yes, I, I believe am. so. <laughs> Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Tiffany Pena. Um, I am a second semester graduate student in the school counseling program. I've been on and off with the Office of Diversity and Inclusion since the spring 2020 semester, as I graduated in spring 2020 and now I'm back. Um, and yeah, I'm also the program manager for the Oz Grand Challenges Academy. Uh, yes. Great. Thank you, Tiffany. Uh, Tiffany, I don't know if she said it, she was our uh, diversity intern in the spring. Um, uh, actually spring, yeah, spring 2020, we're uh, between interns right now. We have a couple new ones coming in in the spring. But um, so thank you. I'm Annika McAvoy. I'm the deputy coordinator for diversity and inclusion. I'm also the deputy coordinator in the Title IX office and still the coordinator for uh, Say Yes to Education students, which is working with students coming to us from Syracuse City and Buffalo City Schools um, with Say Yes funding. So, and I'm uh, she, her, hers, and we're gonna move along. So let's see if I can, there we go. Uh, so nonviolent communication, here's a standard definition is an approach to nonviolent living developed by Marshall Rosenberg beginning in the 60s. Uh, it's taught as a process of interpersonal communication designed to improve compassionate connection to others. Uh, and so it's interesting because it's when you kind of hear the definition in general, it's, it's a way to communicate, it's to improve com compassionate connection. It doesn't seem that difficult, but it, it's interesting. Um, we even as an office have been working with some statements and and developing kind of NVC dialogues around the statements. And it's, it is challenging, especially if you're, you're really giving your attention to it and, and thinking carefully. And for some conversations, it's hard. For some, it's a little easier. 
Um, the quote at the bottom, a Rumi quote, out beyond the ideas of wrongdoing and right doing, there is a field. I will meet you there. Very nice. Um, but what really resonates there is this idea of wrong and right. And so often we engage in wanting to help other people see the right way or bringing somebody around to our point of view or changing somebody's mind. Uh, and really nonviolent communication is more about um, kind of honoring one another's voices and creating a space for conversation, you know, maybe with a little something to move forward with on the other side. Um, the door just opened. Um, so that's just a general overview. Um, but one of the things that we think, uh, and Marshall Rosenberg thought were really important to beginning to engage in this process uh, are to really think about empathy, self-empathy, empathy for others, and honest self-expression. And that's always interesting to talk about, you know, what is this idea of honesty? Um, but in terms of self-empathy, um, you know, I think on, on one level, and I'm sure a lot of you agree with me, I think I have a lot of empathy for myself. I think I give myself a lot of leeway to figure things out. But I know that in the moment where I, I misstep or I'm uncomfortable, um, whatever I might think consciously, I certainly have a, a very um, using internal dialogue that can emerge. Uh, and, and when we're thinking about self-empathy, we're really trying to get ourselves out of that space, being aware that that's happening. Right, and Colleen, C O L L E E N. Did only I hear that? Okay. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, kind of to move out of that space of judging and just being aware of the way that you're feeling, right? So, so think of any mistake you've made in the past week. Um, as a parent, I feel like I make it a couple every day where I kind of have to backpedal. I said it wrong, I was too quick. Um, and instead of really getting jammed up, just being aware of how I feel and maybe acknowledging with the people I'm with and, and move on. Um, empathy for others is kind of similar, you know, that, that same kind of listening, kind of relaxing and paying attention to what's happening uh, to your body um, and extending that to the person you're talking to, but also taking the time to objectively engage with, with what somebody's offering you. So um, if, they're, if, you know, if they're saying something that would cause you not to have empathy, to kind of objectively share what you're hearing, uh, which as we move along, you'll see is one of the first steps in the, in the NVC process. Um, and then we come to honest self-expression. And again, I think we live in a culture where the idea of honesty is kind of, um, and up in your face telling folks how it is, right? But uh, in this context, we're really talking about sharing what we're observing, sharing our feelings, sharing our needs, making a request. And so it's really kind of slowing down uh, kind of an immediate honesty that we sometimes feel called to. Uh, and again, opening it up, opening up in that space um, to actually communicate, which is sometimes is different than maybe what we would consider honesty. Um, so any questions so far, any, this is so weird because I can only see four people at a time and <laughs> <laughs> so, and I can't see a chat or anything. So I'm, I'm going to keep moving along. Um, so, so one second, Annika, I want okay, to, one, one little pause here. One of the things that is, um, important about the general approach of the method is okay. that, um, it helps um, nonviolent communication, um, people connect into uh, a language that it can express um, their emotions and their needs, um, but gets us away from, importantly, the sort of diagnostic judgmental sort of things that we do. So, and again, I don't wanna oversimplify this. There's, there's ways we can fall into this, this this two two pronged path, maybe maybe multi pronged, but really two pronged in some ways, curiosity or judgment, right? Um, and there's something about the ways in which we can live our lives in some ways where we make judgments. We do all this diagnostic work and assumptions and things like that. Um, 
re- like about a month ago, I had to go and check on my mom who's in a adult care facility and I got cut off in traffic. I had an entire narrative about the person who cut me off. I had a whole diagnosis of their behavior, whole story in my head about them, none of which could be true. I actually don't know what was going on for that person. And if I reflect back to 1995, when my father had a major heart attack, I was driving like a combination of your worst NASCAR driver in a demolition derby. I was all over the road trying to get to the hospital. And I'm sure people had all kinds of ideas and stories about what was going on with me, none of which may have been true. So it suspends those assumptions and judgments like that and creates a context for communication where both people can talk, can express their emotions, their needs, things like that, rather than um, competing judgments and assumptions around one another. So that's. Thanks, Robin. I love the, the driving example. I've heard you give it. And uh, I know that I have like four examples in my head whenever you share it <laughs> that are similar. Like one thing was happening, but I know it looked like something else. Um, so, so this uh, practice was developed by Marshall Rosenberg. He was a communications coach. He was a mediator for civil rights and student act- activists. Um, and, and he really developed this approach during the civil rights era. Um, and uh, he, he has a book on the process and uh, he talks a lot about kind of being in spaces, especially with youth and kind of being aware that kids were making assumptions about him and, and using this as a way to kind of help them see that he really wanted to communicate with them and know them and give them a space to, to communicate with him and let themselves be known. Um, I first encountered this practice when I was in grad school in my uh, MAT program for TESOL. Um, And in that context, it was shared really when we were first starting to talk about um, watching other people teach uh, and, and being there. And, you know, I think a lot of folks will come back and say, I learned from their mistakes, you know, or, or I learned this from a great this great, the kids really love this teacher. Um, but if we're, we're sitting in a classroom in kind of a, in a kind of a NVC frame of mind, we're really observing, right? And then checking in on how we're feeling, we're seeing what's happening and then checking in on how we're feeling and then thinking about what the needs of the moment are. So uh, it takes us out of that immediate judgment space and kind of guides our eye to what's actually happening in the room because what's actually happening is what's causing all the other pieces to be in motion, right? Either whether the students were engaged or not, it's it's not about attitude, it's about very intentional decisions happening in the space. So I think again, as we think about this in our own teaching spaces, it's this idea of developing intentionality in, in how we're presenting material and engaging with students. So, so there he is, Marshall. I saw him present at a TESOL conference in Dallas and the room was packed. Uh, so, and I don't think, I think he died maybe a year later. So I'm, I'm glad I got to have that moment. Um, so, uh, so really the practice breaks down to four components and we've, we've kind of touched on them when uh, talking about empathy or even as Robin talks about, you see people saw me driving and they could have made a lot of assumptions about what was happening. Um, but it, instead of making the assumptions, you just stop at the ob- observation. You know, that person's driving erratically. <laughs> And then you might say, it makes me feel anxious. (laughs) I need to feel safe on the road. (laughs) Um, So it's observing, uh, it's checking in on feelings, it's checking in on needs. And then if you're really engaged with somebody, maybe kind of offering something for moving forward, maybe making a request um, that'll either kind of help you engage the person with you or help you engage with the person um, because it's a two way street. So it's a neutral observation. Uh, And again, it's done most easily. This is something we talk about with microaggressions too, with just beginning by saying what you heard, what I heard you say was, you know, and I I think there's even power sometimes um, in folks hearing their words framed up objectively. So we have a little example. Uh, So, and this is gonna carry through all four of the steps. So uh, let's say we're talking about immigration and somebody says, we have to do something about the illegal immigrant problem because they're, oh, hang on, stop. This one's Tiffany's and I stole it. 
Tiffany, where are you? <laughs> Say pineapple. <laughs> I didn't want to interrupt. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I was on such a roll. <laughs> um, so to continue with the examples of, of um, person one. So they would say we have to do something about the illegal immigration problem because they're taking away our jobs and people, people like you don't care. So as the responding person um, to fully encompass NVT, you would say, I'm hearing you say that you're worried about your job security and that other people in this country are ignoring that concern. So this tool slows the pace of conversation and forces both sides to reflect and clarify without using um, any emotion or judgment. Um, I think, I feel like when I think about doing this, I think about two things. One, I don't actually believe people always make statements out of this directly because they're scared about their own jobs. I actually kind of feel like other things are happening. <laughs> but I think the, the mechanics of this statement, again, if you kind of direct somebody back, so this is what you're scared of. If it's not what you're scared of, what are you scared of? You know, what is what, you know, it, it can kind of get you a little closer to the truth of the moment. Um, so, oh, hang on. Um, Markel's going to do the next one. I'm not going to cut in at all. <laughs> all right. Can you hear me well? Yes. All right. Sounds good. Okay. First of all, go Bill. Go Buffalo Bill. Um, so thank you, Tiff, for that. So after that, um, we're going to talk about describing emotions and not positions. So kind of um, getting more clarity and what the person is talking about in the, uh, in the situation. So you want to talk about um, kind of getting, getting more clarity, um, having the person who you're, you know, in this interaction with, um, describe, uh, more on their emotions on um, rather on how they feel specifically about that position, like what side they're on. Um, so you want to express pure emotions, um, and body sensations rather than what you think or perceive that someone is saying to you. Um, and when we're, when we're in this step, we kind of want to shy away from um, victim verbs, um, which are thoughts that's, or that's disguised as feelings that often contain blame, such as guilt. Um, so these are so, some examples of this is, I feel insulted, I feel attacked, I feel blamed, unappreciated, disrespected, ignored, um, and misunderstood. And we can go to the example on that. Um, so going back to that immigration example, um, so the second the second step would be um, kind of like I said, getting that uh, clarity. So are you feeling frightened and disrespected um, rather than saying that um, immigrants are entitled to certain rights? So kind of still having a um, a neutral stance on um, on that interaction that you're having or the statement that's uh, being discussed. So it's interesting, um, if you were to go to the NVC website, and we can share some of these materials with folks afterward, we, we have them. They have a whole dictionary of words for positive and negative feelings, right? So it seems like you would just tell somebody how you're feeling. But I, I, when we were going through the practice things, I found myself using the list of words because sometimes you're just like, no, I'm, just, I'm mad, right? But it, there's more nuance often to, to what we're actually feeling in a moment. So, um, um, at first it seems overwhelming and then you realize this is helpful and they're grouped and categorized. Um, so uh, moving out of sharing your emotions, you know, your emotions are based on your needs. So you would then um, identify needs. And again, they, they may be yours. They may be thinking about the, the needs of the speaker. Um, but uh, our needs are kind of, they're based in, Marshall Rosenberg's idea of needs are really based in human needs. You know, we need connection, we need honesty, we need peace, we need play, we need physical well being, a sense of meaning, autonomy, freedom. Um, so, you know, I think in any moment, if you're, if you're checking in there, um, you might feel, you know, I know I had a conversation with an aunt in the fall where I really felt so alienated by the things she was saying. So one thing that she, that I felt threatened was my sense of connection. Um, also my sense of peace and my 
my own version of meaning in the world. <laughs> but, but I think, you know, in this difficult conversation with a family member, a part of what heightens the, the emotion of the moment was, this is somebody that I love and my connection was threatened. So looking at our immigration example again, um, the person concerned about, uh, concerned with an immigration cr crack, crackdown, I'd say, I want to be confident that I and my family have some stability. You know, that might be what they go back to. Um, the, the person questioning that thinking might say, are you looking for awareness for the situation you're in? So do you, do you feel like people don't know your experience in this conversation about immigration? Maybe somebody lost a job and you're connecting it to this idea that somebody else came and took it. Um, so uh, again, looking at what your needs are, needs for stability, needs for safety, needs for a home. Uh, so, um, so making a request, uh, we did a, pre we, last time we did this presentation, we did it with students and I was in a, in my group, I had a student, um, we used a really difficult statement, um, which is white privilege is not real, uh, as the starting point. And she really, really stuck in with position, 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 right? And it was hard to move from that to how are you feeling? What do you actually need? And, and I, you know, you have to respect that it was, it was a very challenging statement. But connected to that, you know, even because she was so dug into position, um, I think this idea of making a request is helpful. Um, but it's a little lighter than just demanding that somebody change their mind. So, um, especially if you're connecting with somebody, and I've seen other, I don't actually think I'm good at this, but I've seen other people do it where I'm really impressed where they say, hey, I wanna offer this for you to read, or maybe we can do this and talk about it, um, you know, in a, in, a, in a more shared, comfortable setting. Um, but where you want this to take you is, is to a place where you can offer something that you think might move somebody forward. And you're also open to something that might help you move forward. Um, I think we've spent four years saying we're not, you can't change other people's minds. But I, I think when we're connecting with folks, that is the opportunity to actually move people forward. Um, so in this immigration context, uh, you might say, would you be willing to read this article I found interesting about immigrants in the economy, right? Um, and then the other person might be curious. Uh, I actually, um, at some point, read, and it was looking at different sides of political debates in the past four, year, four years, that Trump actually believed that um, a strong economy was the answer to some of uh, to societal injustice, that everybody would have a job if we had a strong economy. I think it's an oversimplification, maybe it checks some things at the door, but um, I, you know, there, if, if someone wants to offer me something that explores that idea, I can at least be open to exploring that idea. And, and I might have something to share with that person that explores maybe a different framework for looking at economics and structural inequality. Um, so, uh, Here's another, uh, okay. So Rosenberg says, I wouldn't expect someone who's been injured to hear my side until they felt I'd fully understood the depth of their pain. And again, when I've seen people do this really well, what I see happening is they're continuing co to connect um, and continuing to, to kind of, maybe not around, even around the context of the conversation, but reaching out to the person that they're engaged in the conversation with. Um, so, I wanna check in, I'm gonna make my screen bigger so I can see everyone or see more folks. Um, and I'm gonna stop this, I think I have to stop the screen share for a second to like mute myself and listen. I don't know, Joe, if anyone wants to give me advice on navigating this. <laughs> Should I stop my Did screen share for a second? Stop the screen share for a second so that then folks can see one another. That, that would be good. Yeah. Okay. I like that. I think I'm a little bit of a tyrant with the screen share. So, oh, and we have like comments and hi, everybody. <laughs> Thank you for introducing yourselves. <laughs> um, so I think as we're talking about this, one of the driving, um, I think when we talked about sharing this um, through the winter breakout sessions, we were thinking this would be helpful in, in the classroom um, or in working with students or colleagues. 
has anyone had any um, challenging moments uh, where someone's made a statement uh, that might have triggered you or upset you or upset students in the in the setting and you haven't quite been sure how to engage or you really were able to engage and and um, maybe made some help something better happen out of it. I don't know if anyone has anything to share. Or is this something you've been grappling with? Like, how do I do this? How do I have these conversations in my class? So I have an example um, that I can share. Emily in sociology, uh, I'm new. I started in August, so a lot of unfamiliar faces this morning. Um, I will never forget this experience. It was my very first semester teaching in my PhD program. Um, at the time, I was ill-equipped to respond effectively. I feel like I am more equipped 10 years later, but still I'm here in this session for a reason. I've got, <laughs> I can always learn. Um, that day, it was an introduction to sociology class. We were talking about uh, kind of systems of inequality uh, broadly, but also racial inequality, uh, specifically racism. And I had a student uh, raise his hand. Um, this was a young uh, man who uh, identified as black and he raised his hand and he said, there are two types of black people in this world. Uh, civilized Black people like myself and uncivilized Black people. And in that moment, um, again, my first semester in the classroom, it's, it's a jaw-dropping statement to make. And I could tell it made me uncomfortable. Anytime I'm uncomfortable, I immediately turn tomato red. And so I know that that happened. Um, I could tell that it made other students in the classroom incredibly uncomfortable. I was like literally without words, which does not happen to me often. Um, I, you know, dumbstruck. Luckily, in like the same moment, somebody who was sitting right next to him, um, she raised her hand and, and kind of unpacked why that was a problematic statement to say and uh, very uh, nicely kind of articulated her alternative uh, perspective on that. Uh, but thank goodness that student <laughs> came in and saved me in that moment. Because um, if not for her, I, I would have really struggled with responding to that. Yeah. Do you think you would have been comfortable sharing your feelings uh, no. in response to that? And this is actually, I have a running list of questions um, that I've been taking down as, as I've been listening to the presentation. And that is like the number one on my list. Is it okay for me to express my feelings to students as an instructor? Uh, because I teach sociology, I teach it, teach it in a very critical way. Um, I have become even more critical over the past decade in a wonderful way for my, pers uh, you know, in, in my opinion. Um, and because, you know, we do talk about issues related to marginalization and systemic oppression and privilege and, you know, all of these things, a lot of times things will surface up. Uh, that evoke a very strong emotional response from me. And I've never thought about sharing that. I always feel like I need to be, you know, more neutral. And I think the reason why I think that is because of the power that I have in the classroom, right? Like, as much as I try to decenter the dynamic, especially when we're having these conversations, it's there. There's no way to get around it. So the classroom contexts are, are, can be interesting and complicated, right? And then there's a, there's a lot of other, there's a lot of other uh, folding issues that can, that can come in there, right? So as a person of color in a, when I was teaching in a classroom, um, uh, sometimes in contexts where I am the first person of color who's in authority position with students who are not people of color, um, there's interesting dynamics there. Um, let me preface 
go back and preface this by saying the more you practice the techniques, the better, the more facility you have with them, right? So like anything else, racquetball, using my cell phone, all these other kinds of things, the, the more you practice it, the more facility that you have. Um, uh, there are ways in which you can say that, you know, look, these, these issues aren't just purely academic or in the realm of ideas or off in the stratosphere for me. I'm personally affected by 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 them, um, but um, as we're exploring, I can share where I'm where I am positioned around these without telling you that this is how you have to be positioned, right? And my goal as an educator, or as a person right now, is not to make people like be carbon copies of myself, okay, uh, psychologically or anything else like that. But it is to get into those to get into those uh, uh, spaces in terms of of, of uh, discussing these things, right? Um, and and maybe one of the things that can be done is that you know you don't have to lead by saying, well, this is how I feel about this stuff, right? But there can be places where you can add into that, you know, um, as a professor and as I, as we're breaking this down, this is how I approach this material and everything else. But as a person living in the world, this is how I'm situated around these things or how I experience this or how I'm connected to this, right? Immigration is not just some intellectual issue that's off out there. Um, there's ways I wanna explore it and really understand it and really dig into it. But there's ways in which I'm affected as a child of an immigrant, right? Um, that, that connect into me in different kinds of ways, okay? Um, so I think there, there can be a place in the classroom from, for this. The other thing is self-empathy, right? Um, it would be wonderful if we were in such ways that we were always perfect in every context in every way. That's just not the human condition, right? Um, and so, you know, I think Michael said this in a session that we did last week, uh, Michael, Michael Chandos is, who's on the call, you know, there's something about being an educator where you have the, 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 the privilege or ability to go back, right? You can revisit stuff, right? You know, you can say, oh, you know, I want to talk about that conversation we had last Tuesday or Wednesday. I want to come back. There's some things you can revisit things, which is great. You can't always do that in life, right? You know, um, uh, I was part of an MLK program uh, uh, Monday evening. Um, and so we, this discussion about Black Lives Matter came up and, you know, we didn't get to complete the discussion. I'm not gonna necessarily, and I've actually reached out to some people to wanna engage with them further, I may not be able to, right? Um, but there is the ability as educators to really um, come back and revisit things um, in ways that really can, NBC can help with that, you know? Um, for the student who said, you know, there's two kinds of people and say, okay, let's, I really wanna understand what what is what you're saying there? Not assume like, oh my God, this person's internalized, you know, structural racism. Boy, boy, do they got a journey to take. You know, <laughs> and, and instead, you know, suspend that judgment. And say, okay, so help me understand. You know, I'm trying to understand what I'm hearing you saying is this. Can we can we dig in this a little bit more? Because I'm curious to understand what what, you, what what exactly what you're saying. What's motivating this and everything else, which opens up a place to to engage with that, right? I think you could even think about um, sharing this framework early in your semester to kind of um, allow a space to, to check in with what is an emotional response to this information. Um, because even as you're trying to be analytical and critical, I think historically, if you look at any um, academic endeavor, there's, there's subjectivity, you know, as you, move through, you know, that effort, just like Rodman said, we, we can't be the perfect person every time humanity creeps in. Um, but uh, to have kind of a very open way to say, this is some humanity, we might be having to check in with this as, as we move on. Um, kind of to, to keep it within, you know, we talked earlier, as we started about guidelines for dialogue to kind of make it okay and give it a structure. Uh, almost makes it more, and you know, one of the things I get concerned about with NBC, um, there's a woman in, um, I think she, she's in Sweden maybe, who's made tons of these NBC videos, and there's something a little too analytical about let's practice how to talk through these heated moments, right? So it actually brings a, a structure into the chaos of our emotions, so it, it might really be helpful. Which that was the other question that I had. Are there resources, like are there readings that you all have found effective to give to students um, in helping them navigate NBC? 
Well, you know, I mean, you, you don't want to <laughs> say to students like, before we start these discussions here, read Marshall Rosenberg's, you know, nonviolent communication books, but we can share some resources. There's some, there's, there's some nice schematizations of, of the process, which I think can be helpful, right? And, and really, again, there's a difference between just um, expulsive venting, right? Like, let me pour cauldrons of my rage upon you, right? <laughs> Versus saying, you know, being in touch with your emotions and understanding what you're experiencing, right? This thing really makes me fearful, or this makes me, you know, I'm experiencing these kinds of things this way. I was in a discussion last week with some people in, in the greater Oswego community about what I described as the riots at the Capitol, right? And the fear that, that and, and concern that I had about and the emotions that I had in viewing that versus what was going on for them. And in these moments, maybe what, you know, and again, so that opened up a path versus a judgment of sort of, you know, those people are insurrectionists. And if you have anything to say that, that they were just demonstrators, you're just racist or, you know, whatever, or silly or ridiculous, those kinds of judgment words that box people up and put them over to the side. Um, people who have a different view from what I, or a different experience of that than I have, I want to understand uh, as much as I want them to understand what's motivating and how I'm concerned about, I want to understand where they're coming from too. Not because I need to be right and prove them wrong, but because you can get into a different dialogic space where you can do some genuine communication and move some stuff along, right? And not just agree to disagree or things or things like that. Um, so being in touch with your emotions, you know, uh, and being able to express the emotions you're experiencing around things does not just have to be, and I'm not saying that you're saying this some way, venting on things like this really pisses me off but you can be like you know this you can get in touch with your emotions in ways that um links you down into well what do i need in this situation like you know when people cut me off i want their car to explode okay right or i want the state troopers to come and arrest them not just give them a ticket i mean lock them up right because they're bad people that's kind of the in the moment kind of argh, rage i have about this um what do i need i need to be safe I, and I hope, and I, what I need, and it's the hardest thing when you're driving in a car, maybe, is I need them to know how their act, how I experienced the, the, their action of like cutting in front of me, right, or whatever, and how what that how that affected me, right? Um, harder to do in cars, despite me screaming at the window and the windshield. Um, easier to do in context when when we are able to communicate, even through mediated means like like Zoom or something like this. So yeah. And even, I just want to add one more thing. When I talk about being introduced to this framework in grad school, I'm no student of sociology, but I remember thinking there was something sociological in the idea of observing, right? And, and I think with everything you're talking about in your class, we, we just acknowledging at the outset that we respond to everything. And, and through the course of that program, we would be checked, you know, I remember doing a language immersion and, you know, being asked to write about the experience as an observation and making a comment about French men and my professor saying, well, what did you see? <laughs> this is your opinion, like what, what did you see? So I think um, the framework actually in, in any discipline where we're talking about trying to get down to facts and observation and distilling uh, in understandings from that um, really aligns well. But I've never taken sociology. <laughs> I know, isn't that crazy? How did I even get a degree? Um, <laughs> I took pottery. <laughs> um, does, so Emily said she'd written down a lot of questions. Does, I would love to. <laughs> um, has anyone else jotted down any questions or? Well, Michael put some stuff in the chat that I think folks should look at. You know, there's ways in which you can incorporate into NVC, um, just like we can talk about the the ways people conflate um, uh, thoughts and feelings. Uh, it's part of NVC separating out like, I feel like you're being racist. Well, that's not a feeling. That's that's actually a thought, right? You know, uh, or disguise those things or encode in them a valuative language, right? Um, language of blame, language of shame, language of denigration, things like that. Or, or other things, right? There's a way to get into spaces and examine how um, 
the ways that people, the language that, that they're using can, can create categories and, and, and get into examine that, right? So yeah, without, without having to, to, to get into the sort of like, I'm right, you're wrong sort of thing, but help them understand there's a framework that we may wanna to explore together because this language, there's this way that this language works and you know, it could be a request that you make back. I would love to explore this distinction that you're making between civilized and uncivilized, right? I, I think there's been stuff written about this. I actually wanna understand your thoughts and why this is an important category for you, but I, I, I would like to actually share some other thoughts about that category as well. So we can explore this together, right? So one of the things we thought we might do was to split the group into breakout rooms um, and either, you know, we have some prepared um, <laughs> difficult statements, um, but folks might actually have something they want to bring up and work through. Um, so we're, we're at a, a mechanical, uh, logistical crossroads. Is logistical a word? Logistic? I don't know. Um, we're at a crossroads of some kind <laughs> where I'm going to need a little help with uh, breakout rooms. I think as we planned it, um, it looks like there are 32 folks in total, but four of those, five of those are out of our office, plus we have John, so 32 kind of minus. Actually, we have 30, 24 people in the room right now. Oh, okay. <laughs> I did take math. <laughs> <laughs> so, so John, if we did two breakout rooms, that would be, that would be good. And then um, Lee, la allowing, you know, Annika to go to room two or me to go to room one or, or, or whatever. Yeah, do your magic, John. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, now, do you have a document you want to share with people now before they go to the, or you'll, you'll have them in the rooms. Okay. So the rooms are now open and everyone should receive an invitation. Hi, Devlin. People are in breakout rooms. Are we all back? We're all back. I think we're all back. We're all back in the big house, in the big room. <laughs> In, um, in, in, in John's tropical paradise. <laughs> Pee Wee's Playhouse. Um, 
Raman, do you want to share your group and what y'all talked about? People hear enough of me talking and flapping my gums. I will ask if anyone in the group wants to share what we uh, talked about. I, from my experience of it, we had a good conversation. A lot of good things were shared, but anyone want to share some of the things we talked about from breakout room one? Are we, oh, you're breakout room I'm room, room one, <laughs> sorry. That's the people who are in the room with me. I just, I just want to say that we do, as, as, um, as a professional, understanding where you stand, um, and that at times you do have to, you, you have to take a step back. Mm -hmm. Um, take necessary baby steps in how you work out a situation that will come up with, with, with a student or with a colleague um, when he when uh, deal with, with sense and sensitive type uh, conversations. Uh, yeah, so. Uh, but also, there's times where you have to have that safe space where you could have deep, deep conversations um, uh, that can be sensitive. With the, with the colleague or with the student, um, and there has to be that space to be able to have those conversations. As mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so as professionals, you're right, we do need to take a step back. We also have a role in creating those contexts for safe conversations, right? Um, there are there are things that because of our identities and other things that in a way that they situate us around issues um, where um, the, the personal and professional collide, right? When George Floyd was murdered, I saw the video and it broke me. And I, I was not ready to step into CDO land and start leading conversations. I, I needed some space to actually, as a person, um, process that. Right, um, but we also, as a community, had contexts for people to share and talk about this. A variety of things we did, and, and through Celt and, and other things, to, to do that. Um, some of the things we talked about were, you know, context creating in our group. Um, how to do that? How to, you know, get deeper in with a person. The the, the statement that. I said, I, I gave to folks was this one that, you know, um, it's actually something from Monday and I'll just say it quickly, you know, capital uh, riots happened, you know, I don't, a person said to me, I don't understand why people are so up in arms about the, what happened on January 6th, you know, uh, when all this stuff happened over the summer with Black Lives Matter and people destroyed property, you know, and people, you know, see that is justified, but they say that the people on the six were rioters, essentially, right? And so how do you, you know, get into a dialogue with that person, right? And so part of it is, 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 is creating those contexts and things like that um, and asking questions and not making assumptions. But I'll stop because we gotta wanna, other folks wanna chime in from the group or uh, we can go over to group two and Annika and everybody else. Anyone from group two want to share? Well, I guess I will because I hogged group two, I think. <laughs> so, um, no, I would just, um, we spent a lot of time discussing how sometimes I don't feel I even have the opportunity to have the conversation 
because what I get is an evaluation at the end of the semester where a student really, you know, not a lot, but one or two students were kind of upset about what they thought was kind of like a political viewpoint that wasn't in my lane, which when I talked about it was more about economic policy. Immigration and trade policies have been the big one in the past four years, whereas the, the, admin, the outgoing administration had policies that were really against common economic consensus and and trying to break that down clearly one or two kind of felt attacked that i was attacking trump's policy that it wasn't really in my purview to do this in this class and the power differential so it seems like you know i i've i've heard um like emily talked about a very difficult conversation like i don't even get to the difficult conversation because it seems like my students are unwilling to question me until they feel relatively safe to vent about how they felt like a captive audience to something they didn't believe so that's, we kind of talked about that. I think Lizette talking about creating space totally connects to, to where, where we left off. Rodney, you were gonna say something, sorry. <laughs> no, and, and, and so Liz, I think that's, that's legitimate, right? You know, I, uh, there, there is a way, and, and I'll use weighted terminology, there's a way that for, in, in, in some students will just wait and wait and then weaponize the class evaluation, right? And then all the things, and again, it's almost, in some ways, it's a, it's a perfect dialogical storm because then they can vent everything else, but they don't have to engage, right? And so- It's a no, drive-by, right? A, yeah. Yeah, call exactly. it a, yeah. So, yeah. So, no, yeah, so, so they're just, they're just going to take the shots and move on. So knowing that, that that may be part of student culture in higher education, it's not unique to Oswego, there are, there are some things that can be done. And that's an important thing to note is that maybe it means pivoting that dialogical context, right? You know, maybe in midterm you have this thing that's like, okay, we're just gonna, we're actually gonna talk about the course now. We're gonna have a meta dialogue here and actually get people into that space to, to, to talk about this and modeling around this, you know? In the past, sometimes what will happen in this course is that people get to this point and then they're thinking, I don't like this, this, and this, but we'll talk about it. So we're going to talk about this, right? I mean, and so there's ways to open it up without putting people on the spot and, 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 and everything else like this. If you're teaching, you know, um, I joked with a friend of mine, um, a philosopher by trade, he's got a person who did like the philosophy of math and like, no one's getting mad about mathematical objects. Like no one... <laughs> No one's coming to your course evaluation saying, I really don't like what you said about circles, okay? <laughs> they're, they're coming at you if you're talking about these issues, and especially if you're unsettling them, right? I mean, just all the data I've seen on that shows that that will crater some percentage of your uh, student evaluations because they're going to react in that, in, the, in that piece. So being able to shift the dialogic context or maybe putting it out front uh, some of the NBC stuff and say, look, this is how we're going to go about that. Um, actually, maybe in the lead up to the student evaluations, right? Um, I, I, you know, towards the, you know, not in the classroom, but towards the end of my teaching career, really wanted to students to understand what the teaching evaluation is. It's not, a, you know, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram post or something like this, but the, the use of the tool and, and what it means for them to really reflect on the success of the course. Right or or their experience of the course, but no, that's I think that's great that you talked about that stuff. Other, I'm, I'm here. I'm dominating the conversation. I need to shut up. Except I want to say something too, <laughs> and, and it's only this. In the same way that Emily talked about sociology as an analytical and critical discipline, socioeconomics, but all the examples uh, Liz is sharing of of policy diverging from fact. If you think about it, that's emotion driven, right? So even kind of opening up that understanding at the beginning, like there, and it, it, you could go back to like, you know, whatever, all the way back through time and find examples of they understood this, but they did this, you know, and why did they do this? Somewhere in there, there's, there's an emotion, either a constituent expressed an emotion that led a, a politician or somebody in power to make a decision to curry favor, right? Um, but I think if you even allow emotion into those policy decisions right next to data, then you're also creating a space to have conversations about how we feel when we're learning about the data and learning about policy decisions. So, so we're almost out of time um, here. Um, Annika, do you want to talk to them about homework and so before we get oh, to- So um, we do have a great uh, exercise 
uh, that we can share um, kind of about exploring self-compassion. Um, so we have that. We also have, um, there's an article that I like, uh, Emily, you talked about how can we share this idea with students. And, and again, there are things that are very focused on the, the framework uh, that break it down. There are little videos, there's a lot of good stuff, but I have an article um, that was really, uh, I think the title of, of, is how to NVC your way through political conversations. And I think it uses the immigration example. I think that's where we got it from. Um, to kind of walk you through what does this look like in, 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 in a difficult conversation that people really are having. So John, how can we share resources? You can drop it in the chat. Even if they're PDFs? Yes. Okay. All right. I'm going to work on that. Robin's going to chat while I do that. <laughs> so, so I'm good at a chat. Um, so um, these are things and there's other resources we have uh, that we can share and stuff like this. Some of the things that you can do is like if you're having class discussions or things like this, you can have people um, incorporate or wire in some MVC techniques into those, right? There's, there's a tool and an exercise that comes out of the New York City MVC Center um, about um, um, uh, assessing feelings and needs, right? Uh, Self-assessment and then thinking about other your interlocutor or something like that. You can wire some something like that, that 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 feelings and needs assessment kind of piece into a class discussion, right? Um, where people are reflecting on, on the emotions being expressed and possible needs that are there for themselves and for other members of, let's say, a discussion pod or something else like that. And it also doesn't have to be in those formal sort of strict analytical ways either, but it is one of those tools that I think is a, is a nice way to do it because, you know, um, in very silly sort of ways, you know, one of the ways I would do it when I was teaching is say, look, you know, you, you know, the, the two sides of something. My, my high school girlfriend that broke up with me because I was an idiot. Um, you know, my experience of that and what I needed in that moment where she's like, we should see other people. It's like, no, you just don't wanna see me. That's what's going on here and all the emotions and everything else. But then stepping away and thinking about what she needed, what emotions are being expressed by her and what she needed in that circumstance and how that changes the lens that I'm viewing the situation. Um, and you can do that in a classroom around really hot issues. So people can move away from their assumptions of American exceptionalism or the things they're habituated in believing and think not only about their needs, but the needs of other people, right? If you're talking about issues like immigration or race relations or racism or struggle, these things, you can build that in. So um, that we should, we should send a, 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 put the link to that, that uh, um, the, uh, the New York City NBC exercise uh, there and and if people want if you've got a write up on this and so forth they can they can uh, email us and everything else so i know this is our time and it's kind of whirlwind or anything else like this any last thoughts from folks i, I want to thank you we move pretty quickly through the material if you have time yourself you know marshall rosenberg's book on nonviolent communication um uh, uh a language of life um, is pretty uh, inexpensive and it's a good um, uh, read that really gets into the technique uh, a lot. Um, so, yeah. I'm sharing some things. I'm going to go get that, the uh, evaluation you just talked about. Yeah. And, and if you have trouble opening these or you can't get those, just, just email uh, myself or Annika or Aaron and we can get those materials uh, to you. If you want to brainstorm about how to, to, to do that in, in whether it's interactions with students uh, in a professional sort of staff setting or in a classroom, we're happy to talk with you about that at any time. So please reach out to us uh, uh, and thank you. I would love if we could have more sessions like this. Like this is something it seems like that needs to be worked on over time and as people sort of develop some understanding. So I hope that this will be, we'll be back together again to be able to talk about this. So, so Kristen, this is where you should be frightened because you're having thoughts that I have. And, and I, every single year uh, that I've been alive have thought this is the year the Buffalo Bills win the Super Bowl, despite empirical evidence and everything else. But now the empirical data seems to semi-support that. Um, no, I've actually, it's one of the things that 
um, we're working on and trying to plan as an office is how to um, really do this work as a series in the semester without conflicting with a lot of other programming and things like that. And we want to host more sessions, uh, and that is the, 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 the plan to do so. Um, uh, in a, in a world where there is more funding or the state isn't in a $15 billion deficit, uh, I would really like to bring in some people, train the trainer, and really get some series of stuff going, not just on campus, in the community. I've already talked to the mayor about doing this kind of work in the community, um, uh, even as war by war dialogues within the city of Oswego. Mm -hmm. um, it's really just sort of a resource thing, but yes, we would love to. And I'm sure that John, was, as a good host, will have us. Um, he's, he's yet to turn me down once when I come and say, hey, we want to do something. So Cell has been a, a valuable and great partner in, in doing this and other work uh, for our community. And I, I do want to, before we, we um, uh, uh, respect respecting people's time and our session, Thank John and Rebecca and everybody else on Colt and everybody who's had a, 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 a hand in planning and facilitating these winter breakout sessions. It's Germano work um, on top of the full time gigs that everybody has. And I, I just think, you know, we, we can just golf clap, use your reaction clap to thank John and Rebecca and everyone on Colt and, and, and everyone who, who does this work behind the scenes because it's a vital work for our community. And thank you for making the time. You know. Thank you, Rodman. Thank you, John. Thank you, yeah. Rebecca. So, Monica.